So in the last video, we talked about the general composition and structure of nucleic acids. We also compared DNA and RNA, two of the most common types of nucleic acids. And we talked about the fact that these are long polymers built of nucleotides. And nucleotides are basically comprised of a phosphate group, which is a high energy group, same energy group that's present on ATP. And we also talked about the relationship between nucleotides and ATP because ATP is basically adenine triphosphate, which is just as adenine monophosphate, which is one of the nucleotides present in RNA. So there's a very, very close relationship between the energy molecule of the cell, or ATP, and the nucleotides that are part of or nucleic acids. And on a future video, this is going to be very important. We also talked about the fact that this nucleotide also includes a 5-carbon sugar. In the case of RNA, is ribose. But the DNA has deoxyribose, which has one less oxygen on carbon-2. And remember, to count carbons, you start from the carbon that's furthest away from the phosphate group, which is that carbon that does not belong to the ring, carbon-5. And so this will be 1, 2, um, 3, 4, 5. Up here, you have an oxygen. It's not a carbon. And the oxygen is how we call the head of that sugar. And it's going to be important for you to determine the anti-parallel direction of the molecule. So pay, pay very close attention to how to count those carbons. But remember, in DNA, the 5-carbon sugar is lacking one of its of the oxygens that usually connects to that carbon. And that's why it's called deoxyribose. And it's why DNA is called the deoxyribonucleic acid, after the sugar that makes it, makes it up. And then you have the bases. And in RNA, you have U... C, A, and G. And in DNA, you have T, C, A, and G. And so these are our basic components of the nucleotides. Now you get several of those nucleotides and you strain it together through phosphodiester bonds which connect one phosphate and the sugar of the next one and you make a DNA strand. And in the case of RNA, it would be the same thing except that you would not have any T's, you would only have U's instead. And then when you have two of those strands and you attach them together um, um, base to base across, across the helixes in um, hydrogen bonds between the base pairs and remember according to the base pairing rules we discussed that A always binds with T and C always binds with G and we also talked about the number of bonds which these molecules will have remember that adenine binds twice with thymine in hydrogen bonds and cytosine binds three times with guanine in hydrogen bonds these are not covalent bonds though they're Vanderwaal forces or just attraction forces between the two sides of the dna double helix which then twists in a twisted ladder format where the rungs of the ladder are the base pairs connected by hydrogen bonds and the steps of the ladder or the backbone is the is the sugar phosphate backbone connected by phosphodiester bonds and this is where we left off as we talked about the other video and now we're going to keep going and explain all the basic basic pieces of the shape of DNA molecule. So, of course, the DNA molecule is a twisted double helix, and that's the model that was presented by Watson and Crick and made him the one Nobel Prize. Now, some of the facts that I have not told you yet is, first of all, let's start with the dimensions. The distance between two of the backbones, or between two of the strands of the double helix DNA molecule, is always constant. It's actually very interesting. As you go through the entire length of the DNA molecule, it's always two nanometers in between, or 20 angstroms. By the way, angstrom is a measurement of atomic sizes, and this is something that we use for very, very small, small distances, as this is, for example. It's, we're talking about microscopic here, billions of times smaller than a meter. And it's always the constant. We'll talk about why that is in a second. Also always constant is the vertical distance between two base pairs. So you see that this distance here will always, always be about 0.34 nanometers or 3.4 angstroms. And that is a very, very small, small distance as well. Uh, another thing, kind of thing that's constant, it it's always takes about 10 base pairs between each full turn. Now, each of five base pairs, you're going to go half of the turn. They will, and then another five base pairs, you turn again and you're right back where you started. Which means the distance for this is always going, always going to be constant at 34 um, angstroms or 3.4 nanometers. And so... This is the normal dimension of a, of a DNA molecule when you actually look at it. And you also have another thing that's constant throughout the entire human genome, in fact, is the base pairing rules. Like we discussed in an earlier video, when you look at humans, about 29.3% of the DNA is going to be adenine, and about 30% of DNA is going to be uh, thymine, which means between the two of them, you're going to have about 60% of the DNA.
and then between uh, guanine and cytosine they're around 20 percent each slightly a little bit more guanine so about 40 percent of the DNA is going to be made of that base pair and remember that this is reflecting the base pairing rules of Edwin Shargraf where he says that A always pairs with T with two hydrogen bonds in between and that G always pairs with C with three hydrogen bonds in between now notice, by the way, that it's always a, a, a purine matched with a pyrimidine. Purines, remember, have two rings. Purine of the dog looks like a dog. And pyrimidines have only one ring like pyramids, our singular geometric structure. And it's always a purine with a pyrimidine, no matter if it's different time, kinds. And that's going to be important in a second. Also notice that the particular percentage will change throughout the life. And, for example, E. coli only has 25% A. And then if you look at a... At a chicken, it will be 28%, but an octopus will be 33%. So th those ratios of A to sh of, of the groups will change. But the fact is, there's always the same amount of adenine, there's, there's thymine, and always the same amount of guanine, there is cytosine. And in humans, there's a lot more uh, adenine and thymine than guanine and cytosine, and that has something to do with gene expression control. Because ahead of every gene in our body, we have promoter boxes, or boxes that... Uh, or pieces of gene which are not actually coding for protein but are basically uh, regulators of whether or not that, pro that gene sequence is going to be expressed. And we'll talk about that when we get to protein synthesis but for now what you need to know is that since one of the most common types of promoters are basically gene sequences rich in adenine and thymine, we call them TATA boxes, T-A-T-A -A boxes. And that's because a lot of T and a lot of A is going to be around in those promoters. That is why adenine and thymine are so much more common than guanine and cytosine. And this is something peculiar to uh, animals such as humans. And that's why the TATA box makes it more common for A and T in or, or things. And also, poly A tails of, of RNA and telomere sequences and centromere sequences are all rich in adenine and thymine as well. And all of that explains why we have more of that than the other one. Another interesting thing about the DNA molecule is that's anti-parallel. And that means that uh, if you look at one side of this or one strand, the orientation of the sugar on one strand is going to be opposite to the orientation of the other, which indicates something peculiar about the way the DNA molecule is structured. And we'll talk about how that is in a second, but also notice always three bonds between C and G, always two bonds between A and T. Okay, now let's review everything we just talked about and understand why the DNA is the way it is, okay? Remember, DNA has a backbone on both sides of the strands, which are basically constituted of a phosphate group, which is a high energy group, uh, also present in the ATP molecules, and you also have a 5-carbon sugar. And remember, to count the carbons of the sugar, you start from the carbon that does not belong to the ring. In this case, on the right side, the five, carbon 5, which is a carbon that doesn't belong to the ring, is on the bottom. And carbon-3 is going to be on the top. And that's why we call that strand the 3 to 5 strand. Or the 3 to 5 strand. Because 3 is up and 5 is down, as you can see here. Now, notice also the oxygen can be, act as a pointer. So you can see the orientation of the sugar, how it's pointing downwards. But on the other side, the oxygen is pointing upwards. And 5 carbon is on the top. And the third carbon is on the bottom. If you go to the 3 to 5 direction, you're going to see it's the opposite. And we call that the 5 to 3 strand. So basically what's happening here is that the backbone on the left is upside down to the backbone on the right. And this is happening because if it didn't, this couldn't happen. The bases would not be able to pair the way they do if the, base, the, the strands were not upside down in relation to each other. You see, imagine that they have to connect in a certain way, like that. Okay, that, This particular way would not work for, for, the, for them. In order for those hydrogen bonds to happen... Each of the nucleotides has to be upside down in relation to the other. They have to be opposite. And that is why the DNA strand is, anti is going to be antiparallel because of the base pairing rules. Okay? Uh, these, when you look at the DNA structure, this also helps us understand why it is the way it is. Now, let's think about each of the things we talked about. First of all, the shape. How do we know the DNA is the shape that it is? We saw a picture, first of all, of that. At first, there was a lot of contention as to what, whether the DNA was a double helix, a triple helix, or even some other kind of structure. But after Rosalind Franklin took that picture, the diffraction x-ray picture of the DNA molecule, and Watson and Crick saw that picture and realized that this is something that is peculiar of all helical structures. They've seen helical structures before, molecules that had structures that were helixes, and they, tell, they, they were able to tell 
DNA must be a double helix. Then they also put that together with Chargraff's base pairing rules and realize the only way you're going to have this base pairing rules making sense is if you have two strands and they must be paired in the middle by those two nitrogenous bases and that's why it must be a double helix. A helix because of the picture, a double helix because of the way the picture looked and because of the base pairing rules that Chargraff had already discovered. So you see how Austin and Quick start putting everything together to explain the way we have just discussed of how the DNA molecule actually looks like. Also, why is DNA always the same width, the, the two, 20 angstroms or 2 nanometers we talked about? If you look in the middle like we just spoke before, it's always a 2-ring purine bonded to a 1-ring purine. You see the same thing happen bottom here. And therefore, it's always going to be 3 rings in the middle. And since you always have the 3 rings in the middle, the distance is always constant, always the same. And the same thing is true about the base to base height. Why do you have a constant height on the base pairs? Well, that's because the phosphodiester bonds is what connects the vertical backbone of the DNA molecule. And since those are always the same bonds, you see one bond here, another one here, another one there, is always a bond between a carbon and uh, the phosphate and the sugar, and in this case, the oxyribose. And that, that's why you're always going to have the same vertical distance. And then, why the nucleus type percentages? Why the way it is? Because of the base pa pairing rules. So again, that explains the way it is. Why into parallel strands? I just mentioned because otherwise the bases wouldn't be able to pair. And then finally, why does the DNA twist? Why is it a twisted double helix? Well, in a, we know that there's hydrogen bond connecting the, the bases in the middle. And those are not really covalent bonds. They're more like van der Waals forces or attraction forces between two different molecules. But what I didn't tell you yet is that there's also very weak vertical attractions between the, the nitrogenous bases. And so when, in physics we learned, I mean, when you have forces applied in two per perpendicular directions, the overall result is that this object is going to be turning. And so that is what causes the DNA helix to twist, because there are vertical attractions as well as horizontal attractions between the strands. And that's what causes the DNA to twist. And that twist actually adds stability to the DNA molecule, and it makes it stick together better. If it didn't twist, if you just stack the bases on top of each other, it would be a lot easier to decompose or destroy the DNA molecule. But with the twist and those extra attractions, those extra vertical attractions, it actually sticks together closely. And that's why it's always twist in exactly the same way, always 10 uh, bases per turn, complete turn, allowing us to actually have a picture of how the DNA actually looks like, which adds more stability to the DNA molecule. And normally, the DNA molecule is turned the way you see here. We call that the B-turn, the, the famous DNA double helix you see. But sometimes when you put the DNA out of the cell and you kind of like separate it, it actually folds weirdly in what you call the A-DNA, which is a strange pattern of, of shift that it looks like. And sometimes it twists backwards. Instead of twisting to the right, because this, is is, this is a right twist that you see happen here. It's the normal twist, okay? But sometimes the DNA accidentally twists to the left, like you see in this last picture on the right here. And then we call that the ZDNA, or South Pole DNA. And if this happens inside a cell, it may lead to mutations as the cell is trying to copy itself. And, and actually, this is going to cause problems for the DNA molecule. And when we learn about mutations, you now understand that doing the DNA copy process, it's, it's harder for DNA to be copied if it's weird up in the Z or South Path DNA like you see there. And now you understand why DNA is the way it is, how DNA actually looks like, and you can put it all together in the evidence as to why DNA has the structure that it does. In the next video, we're going to review quickly the chromosomal structure of the DNA molecule. See you guys then.